uh, appeal to the senses. Indeed, in, in uh, movements of modernism and postmodernism, uh, there was visual art without beauty, literature without narrative and plot, poetry without meter and rhyme, architecture and planning without ornament, human scale, green space, natural light, music without melody and rhythm, and criticism without clarity, attention to aesthetics, and insight into the human condition. Um, let me just give you an example to back up that last statement. But here, they're one of the most famous literary uh, English scholars of our time is the uh, Berkeley professor Judith Butler. Uh, and uh, here is a, an example of uh, one of her uh, analyses. The move from a structuralist account in which capital is understood to structure social relations in relatively homologous ways to a view of hegemony in which power relations are subject to repetition, convergence, and rearticulation brought the question of temporality into the thinking of structure and marked a shift from a form of Althusserian theory that takes structural totalities as theoretical objects. Well, you get the idea. Uh, by the way, this is one sentence. Uh, you, can actually, you can actually parse it. Well. Uh, the argument in the blank slate was that um, elite art and criticism in the 20th century, although not the arts in general, uh, have disdained beauty, pleasure, clarity, insight, and style. People are staying away from elite art and criticism. What a puzzle. I wonder why. Uh, well, this turned out to be probably the most uh, controversial claim in the book. Someone asked me whether I stuck it in uh, in order to deflect uh, uh, ire from discussions of Know, gender and Nazism and race and so on. I won't, I won't uh, comment on that. Uh, but um, it certainly uh, uh, inspired a, uh, uh, an energetic reaction from many uh, university professors. Well, the other uh, hot button is parenting. And the starting point is the, uh, for that discussion was the fact that we um, have all uh, been subject to the advice of the parenting industrial complex. Uh, now, here is. Here is a representative quote from a besieged mother. I'm overwhelmed with parenting advice. I'm supposed to do lots of physical activity with my kids so I can instill in them a physical fitness habit so they'll grow up to be healthy adults. And I'm supposed to do all kinds of intellectual play so they'll grow up smart. And there are all kinds of play. Clay for finger dexterity, word games for reading success, large motor play, small motor play. I feel like I could devote my life to figuring out what to play with my kids. And I think anyone who's recently been a parent can sympathize with this, uh, with this mother. Well, here's some sobering facts about uh, parenting. Most studies of parenting on which this advice uh, is based are useless. They're useless because they don't control for heritability. They measure some correlation between what the parents do, how the children turn out, and assume a causal relation, that the parenting shaped the child. Parents who talk a lot to their kids have kids who grew up to be articulate. Parents who spank their kids have kids grew up, who grew up to be violent, and so on. And very few of them control for the possibility that parents pass on genes for uh, that increase the chances a child will be articulate or violent and so on, until the studies are redone with adoptive children who provide an environment but not genes to their kids, we have no way of knowing whether these conclusions are valid. The genetically controlled studies have some sobering results. Remember the Malifert twins, separated at birth, then they meet in the uh, patent office, remarkably similar. Well, what would have happened if the Malifert twins had grown up together? You might think, well, then they'd be even more similar because not only would they share their genes, but they would also share their environment. That would make them super similar, right? Wrong. Identical twins or any siblings who are separated at birth uh, are no less similar than if they had grown up together. Everything that happens to you in a given home over all of those years appears to leave no permanent stamp on your personality or intellect. <laughs> Uh, a complementary finding from a completely different methodology is that adopted siblings reared together, the mirror image of identical twins reared apart, they share their parents, their home, their neighborhood, uh, don't share their genes, end up not similar at all. Okay, two different bodies of research with a similar finding. What it suggests is that children are shaped not by their parents over the long run, but in part, only in part, by their genes, in part by their culture, the culture of the country at large and the children's own culture, namely their peer group, as we heard from Jill Sobuel earlier today. That's what kids care about. And to a very large extent, larger than most people are prepared to acknowledge by chance. Chance events in the wiring of the brain in utero, chance events as you live your life. 
Um, so let me uh, conclude with um, just a remark to bring it back to the theme of choices. Um, I think that the sciences of human nature, behavioral genetics, evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, cognitive science, are going to increasingly in the years to come uh, upset various dogmas, careers, and deeply held political belief systems. And that presents us with a choice. The choice is whether uh, certain facts about humans or topics are to be considered taboos, uh, forbidden knowledge, where we shouldn't go there because no good can come from it, or to explore them honestly. Uh, I have my own uh, uh, answer to that question, uh, which comes from a great artist of the 19th century, Anton Chekhov, who uh, said, man will become better when you show him uh, what he is like. And uh, I think that uh, the argument can't be put any more eloquently than that. Thank you very much.